Well, thank you, Real Life. It is a privilege to be with you today. Uh, and I'm so grateful to be here to share with you about what God's doing in our life. I was joking with Micah that the last time that we were here and I got to share with, with this Austin campus that we were in a tent on this property and it was 110 degrees outside. Uh, so it must be me that brings the weather. Uh, but I'm really glad we're in a building today. <laughs> but I'm so grateful to be here because what God has done in Corpus and what God is continuing to do here in Austin has had a huge impact on me, on my life, on my faith journey, and also on the man and the pastor that I am today. As Micah shared, we are preparing to plant a church in Houston uh, called Story Church. But before we jump into all of it, I first just want to introduce you to my family. This picture up here is the Castillo family. Yeah, it's my beautiful wife, Emily, and then we have three kids. Penelope is eight, Evelyn is six, and Josiah is three. And not picture, we have an 11-year-old Labrador, and also, in the midst of all of this transition, all of this change, all this chaos, I thought it would be a good idea to show up one day with a golden retriever puppy, and uh, they don't come trained. So you could pray for us. Or if you want a dog. Uh, But Emily and I have spent the last seven years in a town south of Houston called Lake Jackson, where I've gotten to serve in a local church as one of their teaching pastors, and it's there that we've made deep relationships and friendships and really built some family, and it's been such a good place for us for the last seven years. And then the day finally came where God was leading both of us to say, it's finally time for us to go be sent and to plant a church. And so as we worked through that and allowed God to lead us, the day finally came where we made that announcement with our church, but really to our church, that we were moving to Houston to plant Story Church. And as you can imagine on that day, it's filled with all these emotions and it's bittersweet Uh, But there was no shortage of encouragement and people congratulating us and our friends and family who were excited for us. But as we continued in the weeks, as the weeks that followed to share our next step in our dreams with our coworkers and people in our community that we knew, there were plenty of people as we shared our dream and our next step who all asked the same question. It's a really good question. Here's what they asked. They all asked, why? Why? And these people love us. These people care for us. But the reason they're asking why is because what we are seeking to do makes no sense. And really by the world standards, what we are stepping out to do in faith makes no worldly sense. And again, these people cared for us. They love us. But really what they're asking when they ask why is they're asking, do we really need more churches? They're asking, why would you pick up everything and move to a new place? Why would you upend your friendships in this family that you've built? Why would you leave your current jobs and and live off of support for a season? Why take a chance when you have such a good thing going? And I want you to know that it's not just these people that we've met or even strangers who ask this question. As God was preparing us for this moment and, and to I make this announcement, we began to share bits and pieces of this information with our kids. Hey, one day we're going to plant a church and we, we think it's going to be Houston. And the day finally came where we told them everything. We told them the place God was sending us to. We told them the timeline and when. And when we told them that, it was with the stipulation that the news that we just shared with them was going to be our little secret and our surprise for a few months until we shared that publicly with everyone. But if you know our oldest daughter, Penny... She loves a good secret, and she's a processor, and so she shared that news with one of her friends, one of her best friends at school. And as you can imagine, her friend, when she heard that Penny was going to be leaving and moving, she was heartbroken. And so what she did was she proceeded to write a letter, not to Penny, but to my wife, to ask her and us to reconsider our move. And uh, I actually have this letter that this sweet little girl wrote, and I want to read it to you this morning. Here's what it says. It says, Dear Mrs. Castillo, I really don't want you to move. I understand why, but I'm, I'm going to miss Penny, and I'm not sure if she's ever going to make friends. <laughs> she's so sweet. She has made friends. 
Why can't y'all just improve this church? I'll never forget you. I hope we have a happy ending. (laughs) Sincerely, Julia. As sweet and as sad as that letter is, it too really is asking the same question. It's saying, I'm sad, but ultimately at the end, why can't you just stay and make your church better? And the more I think about these interactions and these conversations and this sweet letter, I recognize that it's actually a really important and it's a really good question to ask. And not just for me to answer for you this morning, but for me to constantly be reminded of why. Why are we doing this? Why are we going? And in order to fully share the why of Story Church, you first have to understand my story. You see, I grew up in a faith tradition that was rules-based. Growing up for me, God was distant. God wasn't near. God was just up there waiting for me to break one of his rules. And I believed that when I did, he was going to come and punish me. He wasn't personal. 100% of the time that I spent in and around church was all spent learning about these rules presented to me by other people, and none of it was spent learning about who Jesus really was. And even though I had grown up in and around church as a young adult and really graduating from high school, I didn't know Jesus. I didn't know who he really was. So I graduated, I went off to college, and I had lots of questions spinning in my head about faith and who Jesus was, and I happened to meet another young college student who, upon hearing what was going on inside of me and my questions, he said something so profound for a 21-year-old college student. He said, you have been told your whole life what to believe about God. And he said, here's what I want to do. I want to read through the Gospel of Mark with you for the next four weeks. But he says, when we get together and we read, he said, I'm not going to tell you anything. He said, I'm just going to ask you questions about what you're seeing in Jesus. He wanted me to see Jesus in his own words, and it changed my life. It changed my life. I met and encountered Jesus really for the first time. Fast forward a few years, I'd given my life to Jesus, trusted him with everything, and I'd started to serve consistently in a local church when God put a new opportunity in front of me. You see, I ran into this really excited guy who couldn't stop talking about what God was doing in Corpus and the massive need that existed in Austin, Texas. I ran into Micah. And eventually, Micah invited me to help plant a new church here in Austin called Real Life. And essentially what he said to me is, I want you to be the youth pastor for this church that we're starting. And our youth ministry is just my kids, and it meets on a trampoline in our backyard. (laughs) Uh, That's a little weird, but okay. And we had perfect attendance uh, (laughs) in those early days. But the truth is, he invited me to be a part of this work, and I'd never heard about church planting before. Maybe you haven't either. You see, every church I'd really gone to in my life was probably there for hundreds of years, and I never thought about how do churches start? How does a church get into this new neighborhood? How does the word and how does the God continue a new work? I just always assumed they were always there. And so the invitation to jump in here in Austin was exciting, but it made no sense. It made no worldly sense. I had a community that I loved where I was. The, soon, the school that I was at, was soon, I was soon approaching graduation. I had security in my plans, in my life. I had a good thing going. And God called me to be a part of this work, and God called me to do something that did not make sense. But what stuck out to me about what God was doing here, it was not an invitation to start a new and to build a new church building in a new neighborhood that didn't have one. It was an invitation to plant a church and really to plant hope in a place that desperately needed it. And it was through what God did here and what God did in Corpus and my experience of that that God forever changed how I viewed what church really is. And it changed me. It changed every person connected to this work that began in a living room and those who began to visit and attend and join, those who were serving and sacrificing, changed everyone who was a part of it, and ultimately it changed me. 
And one of the sweetest memories that I will ever have in this life that I will remember to the day that I die was the first baptism services that this church ever celebrated. It was there that I had the opportunity to baptize both of my parents. I have a picture to show you this morning. <clears throat> yeah. This is real life Austin. These are the first baptism services you ever celebrated. And it was through this church plant and what God was doing in Austin and in Corpus that my two parents' story changed as well. Very much like me, they had never encountered who Jesus really was. And it was through what God was doing here that he changed them and he met them. And through a group of people sacrificing and trusting God, working selflessly, God brought hope to a new place and to people who desperately needed it. And it was a beautiful thing to experience. It was a beautiful thing to be a part of and to, to, to visit and to see that it's continuing to happen. And here is the beauty of what hopefully happens in every church plant and in every existing church. The Apostle Paul, who, who wrote to us in the New Testament, the Apostle Paul was an early church leader. and He was a church planter. Here's what he wrote to us in his letter to Rome, which we call the book of, the book of Romans. Here's what he said. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That is a beautiful promise that no matter who you are, what you've done, where you're from, that if you call out to the Lord, he will meet you. What a beautiful promise. But look at what he goes on to say. Here's this beautiful thing. But how then can they call on the one whom they have, they have not believed in? How can they believe in the one whom they have not heard? How can they hear without someone preaching to them? And how can anyone preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. This is the truth. And I want you to see it this morning. You are sitting in this room today because someone brought the good news to you a friend, a family member, a pastor, a parent, a coworker, somebody brought the good news or an invitation to you. The good news that started on the day that Jesus came back to life on that first Easter, it began to spread that news throughout the people and throughout generations and ultimately it came to you. And the Apostle Paul is saying that that news has the power to change us. It's the greatest news the world has ever heard, but we must keep sending people. We must keep telling the world this good news, and it's because of that reason that we plant churches in Corpus, in Austin, and in Houston. The work is too important, and it will always be hard. We have felt so many things in the midst of this process of jumping out and trusting God to catch us as we start a new church. It is very exciting, but it's also very hard. You may have experienced that before. You may have experienced deciding in your life that I want to turn over a new leaf. I want to make a change. I want to start to follow God. I want to stop doing something, start doing something, maybe even this year. And if you've ever done that before, have you ever recognized how quickly things begin to get in the way? Stuff begins to happen. You've probably experienced that maybe even recently. I'll tell you, last Saturday, our family moved to Houston. And that Saturday night was full of, it was a whirlwind. It was chaotic, chaos, exciting. We get everybody where we're going. The next morning we wake up, we say, we're going to church this morning. We get in the car, we turn it on, and there is that check engine light. Now take it to the mechanic, and the news is not good. I have to keep asking him to repeat over to me, like, are you sure this is the same car? I didn't know it was worth that much. <laughs> but that's, it comes with the territory. Stepping out and trusting God, things will happen. Stuff will get in the way. It is hard, but it's worth it. We didn't move and decide to make this move because we didn't like where we were. We decided to make this move because we want to plant the same type of hope that exists here and in Corpus a place where people who are far from God, questioning their worth, can come home. 
And so that's why we go. That's why we're picking up and moving, and that's why Story Church will exist. I want to tell you a little bit about the dream God's placed in our hearts. This is Story Church. We want to invite people into God's great story. I love this quote, Andrew Peterson, he's a musician and an author. Here's what he said. He said, if you want people to know the truth, tell them. If you want people to love the truth, tell them a story. And I just believe this is so true. And what I know is true about me and I know is true about you is you love stories. You're drawn to good books and good movies. You're drawn to people who can tell stories. Why? It's because God made you that way. Because he is a storyteller. God's telling a great story. And we want people to see see that story. We want people to see themselves in his great story. That's why Jesus, when he sat and he began to teach the people, he used stories to communicate really big truth in ways that they could understand. You love stories because God made you that way. And so we want to Tell God's great story. So here's where we're going. Here's where we we believe God is sending us. We're moving to the northwest part of Houston up here on this map. And that little place, if you zoom in, there is a master plan community called Bridgeland. It's about 15, 20 square miles. Houston is exploding with growth, just like Austin. And it's really spilling over into the west and the northwest side. It's happening all around, but this one community we feel specifically led to. And here's what's happening specifically in this area called Bridgeland. It's built, it's really broken into five villages. Everything on the right side is about 75, 80% done. Everything on the left side is just starting. There are about 20,000 people who currently live in this 15 square miles. It will turn into, in the next seven, eight years when it's done, about 80, 85,000 people when it's all said and done. It is growing quick. And what's crazy about it is there are young families moving from all over the world in Houston to this area. This area is built with trails and parks, everything you could want for your kids, and so people are flocking here. And not only is it lots of people, not only is it young families, but it's incredibly diverse. The city of Houston, much like Austin, is incredibly culturally diverse. And the cultural diversity is being squeezed into that 15 square miles called Bridgeland. When it's all done, there will be about eight elementary schools, and just one of them recently, just one, posted on Diversity Day. They made a post, and they said in their one elementary school, there were 29 countries represented and 36 languages spoken. It is a unique opportunity that we feel God is leading us towards. And not only that, one of the things we talk about often is We know that we are called to the ends of the earth as people to reach. And we say, man, in Houston and in Bridgeland, the world is moving to us. What an opportunity. What a gift. And so this is where we're headed, but we want to plant a church much like this one, a church that is outward focused, a church that cares about those who are not yet here. We talk about often, we pray for the empty chair. Who needs to hear this good news? Who feels far from God that needs to be welcomed home? And that's why Story Church will exist. And there is plenty of work to do. We're excited about this next year. There's so much to do. We've got money to raise. There's people to gather and to invite into our team. And there are thousands upon thousands of people who need to be reached with this good news. But why do we do all of this Why do we do what is hard? Ultimately, it's because of this. Look at what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 9. It says that when Jesus saw the crowds, many who were following, some who were just living their lives, it says he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. It says then he turned to his disciples and here's what he said to them. The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. In Jesus' own words, the harvest is plentiful. There are thousands upon thousands of people everywhere you look, in this community and in that one, who have not yet heard or experienced or met Jesus for who he really is. And Jesus said, there is so much work to get done 
The fields are ripe for harvest, but there are not enough workers. There are not enough people who have said yes to taking the good news to them. The need is there. Massive need. And there are people who have not heard the life-changing, peace-giving, good news of Jesus. And you might wonder this morning, like, is that really true? In 2024, are there people who have not heard about Jesus? Are there people who have not really heard this news? The truth is there are plenty of people who have heard about Jesus. There are plenty of people who have heard about him. They've been told by other people who he is and what to believe, and they have a skewed view of who Jesus truly is, and there are countless people who need to experience and encounter him for who he really is. And we want to reach people with that truth, to introduce them to who Jesus really is. And our goal at Story Church is the same reason this church real life, and here in Austin specifically, was planted 12 years ago. We want to reach people far from God, those who don't know Jesus, and we want to welcome them and it's for people like that that we go. I want to tell you just about a story that happened in our family's life a few months ago. When we decided to tell our kids that we were finally moving and where we were going, we decided that we were going to spend the day in Bridgeland and playing with our kids in the parks and bringing our dogs and doing all the things. And at the end of the day, we were going to tell them, this is the place. And during the day, I found myself with my oldest daughter, Penny, at the dog park, just playing with our dog, and I met a man named John. And he was just there with his dog, and we just started talking, and I said, John, tell me your story. Who are you? And I said, John, when did you move to Bridgeland? And John just proceeded to tell me all about his life. He just shared vulnerably all of it. And John just proceeded to tell me that he had made a lot of mistakes in his life. He said, you know, I really dropped the ball with my kids growing up. And he said, so the reason I moved here is I moved here because I want to be near my grandkids. And I want to be for them what I wasn't for my kids. And I want to try to make up for lost time with my kids. And so John just began to tell me all about his life. And then he said, so when did you move to Bridgeland? And I said, well, I haven't moved here yet, but we're going to. And I said, John, we're actually moving here to plant a church to introduce people to who Jesus really is. Immediately, John's demeanor changed, and he looked at me and he said, listen, I hope that what you're coming to do, it works. I hope it's successful. I hope it flourishes. He said, but I just want you to know that I will never come to your church. I said, that's okay, John. Anyways, uh, (laughs) and we just kept talking about our lives and things and Bridgeland. And when we were done, several minutes later, I remember just looking to John as we were saying goodbye. And I said, John, I really enjoyed meeting you. I said, John, I really hope to see you again one day. (laughs) And he looked at me and he said, I don't think you heard me earlier. I will never come to your church. And I just laughed and I said, John, I'm talking about seeing you again at the dog park. (laughs) He said, oh, yeah, of course. I'd love to bring your dog. It'd be great. And then we were fine and good. And I got in the car, and my daughter was with me, and I said, Penny, did you hear that conversation? She said, yeah. She said, it was a little strange. I said, yeah, okay. Well, a few months later, I was laying in bed with my daughter, Penny, and putting her to bed, and she has got a huge heart, and she is a deep thinker. And we're just sitting in bed talking, and she, she just throws out the biggest life questions out of the blue. Maybe your kids are like that too. And we're just sitting there talking, getting ready for bed. And she said, Dad, when Jesus was crucified, were there like people beside him? Criminals? I was like, uh, yeah. Yeah, there were. I said, Penny, let's let's read about it. And so I just, we pulled out her Bible and we just read that account in, in, in one of the Gospels. And so we read this moment in Jesus' life when Jesus is crucified on the cross that there's two criminals being punished as well, one on either side of him. And it says that one of the criminals begins to call out to Jesus and mock him. And everyone is really mocking Jesus in this moment. And they're saying, you're not really a king. You're not really the Messiah. Look at you. And so this, this criminal begins to do the same. And he says, Jesus, you claim to be this great king, this great Messiah. Well, look at you now. 
you're dying on this cross next to us. He says, if you really were a king, you would come down from that cross. And yet, the other criminal calls out as well, and he begins to rebuke this man. And he calls out to him, and he says, listen, don't you realize what's happening here? He says, we deserve to be here. We are criminals, and we are being punished for what we've done. But he said, this man, Jesus, does not deserve to be here. And with his last breaths, he turns to Jesus and he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And with his last breath, he's really saying, Jesus, listen, I believe you are who you say you are. I believe that I deserve this, but you do not. He's saying, Jesus, I believe you're a king. Would you remember me when you come into your kingdom? Jesus looks at this man and he says, Truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. We read that story, and my daughter just asked, did he die? I said, the man, yeah, he died. Was he with Jesus? I said, Penny, Jesus made him a promise. He is. So we sit there, and we're just processing, and then she asked me, what about the other man? I said, well, Penny... What we can read here in this moment is this man lived his whole life and and never chose to trust in Jesus. He's dying beside him on the cross, but this man just does not believe Jesus is there dying for him. And so he lived his whole life and never chose to turn to him. My daughter's processing through this, and I just said, Penny, how does that make you feel? She said, sad. I said, yeah, Penny, me too. I'm really sad. And then my daughter's just profound wisdom and how her brain works. We're sitting there kind of crying. She thought back to the dog park. She said, Dad, which one's John? I said, Penny, I don't know. I don't know. I said, based on what John told us, Penny, I don't believe he really knows Jesus. There's something in his story that leads him to say he would never come to our church, but I don't know if he's really met Jesus yet. And as we're just sitting there processing, I just looked at her and I said, Penny, that's why we're moving. I said, Penny, we're not moving to this new place because we want to live in a new place. We're leaving everything we know. It's hard. We don't just want to live in this neighborhood or in a new house. I said, Penny, ultimately we're doing all of these hard things because we want to introduce people like John to Jesus. We want more of people like the man on the cross who said, Jesus, I need you. I want to come home. I wouldn't trade that moment for the world. And really, as we talk about why, why go, why do what is hard, why do what makes no sense, I think about John. I think about the thousands of people who have yet to meet Jesus. They've been told about who he is. They may have experienced hard things from people claiming to follow Jesus, but they've never met him and seen him in his own world like I did. And so when people ask, why leave a good thing? Why move away? Why do what's hard? Why do what makes no sense? When people like my sweet daughter's friend ask, why can't you just make your current church better? The answer is we go because of people like John, people who need to hear the good news. We go because someone brought that good news to me. And there are millions who have yet to meet and see Jesus for who he really is. And I want you to know this morning, real life in Corpus and in Austin, I'm not the only one called to be a planter. I am moving to Houston to reach thousands of people in need, but I want you to know there are thousands of people in this community and in your community who have yet to meet Jesus. You are called to be planters of hope everywhere that you go.
and in Corpus and in Austin and yes, in Houston. You are in this room because the good news and an invitation came to you. Someone reached out to you. Someone shared with you. Someone was praying for you. That living room 12 years ago, there's a group of people that you have never met who are praying for you. And so we want to do the same. We want to plant a church in that community that people can find hope and where people can find hope. My parents are where they are because other people sacrificed, prayed for them, and put them first. I am where I am because other people sacrificed, put me first, and prayed for me. And my challenge to you in this year in real life is will you pray for that empty chair? Will you pray for those who are not here yet? Will you realize that you've been given this good and great news that needs to be sent and that people need to hear always and until Jesus comes home. Someone prayed for you, someone invited you, and someone cared for you. Who else needs to experience what you have? I want to thank you for letting me share with you today. And I want to thank you for keeping the mission alive that what was only a dream 12 years ago in that living room has come to fruition and is continuing to happen week in and week out here. And for that, I'm incredibly grateful. And I'm excited to see what God does in the years to come. Thank you.